Hello, I hope everybody's here to see what you can do with scan data in SketchUp. Uh, my name is Mitchell Stangle, and Dave and I sponsored this event, and uh, Caden Capella, who works with me, is going to do most of the presentation and the real hard work. Um, I have a small engineering firm in uh, Western Mass, and we just do industrial work. We start. We got scanners three years ago, and what it's done for us is kind of revolutionized our workflow in terms of getting as-built information. It really improved our accuracy in the field because we just go out and scan, and then we have data, a ton of data, more than we, um, I think, more than we ever thought we would. So, but you guys, how many people here are architects? Mm, a little bit more than half. Engineers, not enough. Um, sorry, landscape architects. Okay, interior design. Did I miss anybody? <laughs> Retired people, yes. Um, okay. Um, the this is the raw data. It's got a lot of use. We have Trimble products, we're using RealWorks. If you're, how many people have used scan data and tried to model with it? That's pretty good, about half. Um, successfully? Yeah, yeah. Has, have people used, um, uh, or let me ask, what products have you used to model? On that? Recap. Recap. <laughs> so we we use RealWorks when we first got the software. Um, it works. It you buy you buy a better piece of software. It will um, pick up surfaces. It will pick up a lot of objects. But it makes very heavy models, and they're hard to work with in SketchUp. Uh, we always would have to take them in and clean them up, simplify them, and it wasn't a pleasant process. Uh, we discovered Undent un un pretty quickly. And uh, that's what we're going to present today, because it allows us to bring the data cloud into SketchUp and model the way we're used to modeling. But before we do that, I'm going to let Dave talk for a minute about how he's seeing in the marketplace the data being used. So. Uh, good morning. So my name is David Berzik. I'm the uh, segment manager with Trimble, uh, the field technology group. Uh, so I'm focused around the development of the 3D laser scanners, uh, the robotic total stations, and also the mixed reality solutions and how it's being used in both the uh, design and construction environment. Uh, so I've worked with Mitch and, and his team around implementing scanning and helping them get up to speed on using scanning for all the work that they do. Uh, and so what we want to just talk about today is really uh, spend the bulk of the presentation allowing you to dive in and see what their workflow is. Uh, but I wanted to take a moment to kind of show you what uh, some of the scan data that's being used in the industry uh, today. Um, scanning in general is starting to become more and more common on projects and just wanted to give you some examples of, of how it's being used on the projects. Uh, so real quick, here's just the outline of what the, the presentation will be talking about. And just going into kind of the uses in general. So why 3D scanning? You know, what you're seeing today out in the industry is a greater demand to have a lot of accuracy in the building information models. Um, owners know the technology is out there. Um, they're requiring it on their projects. And a lot of construction teams are starting to use it as well as, as, well as the design teams. Um, and the scanning is being used to go out and document, I, I refer to it as the as-is conditions. Um, being able to go out, use scan data for pre-construction planning, determining how you're going to approach things on a job site, uh, tracking the progression of construction, and then even providing project deliver, uh, deliverables. A lot of uh, owners are now requiring at the end of the project to turn over scan data in addition to a uh, reconciled model at the end of the project because they want to be able to have this measurement information before things get covered up and hidden in the walls that they can come back to and reference at later points in time before they start to go through and you know, tear things apart and start to make changes to their facilities. And then one of the new areas that you're starting to see scan data being used is around construction verification, using the scan to compare back against the 3D model to track the progression of construction and determine you know, what has been installed, what hasn't been installed. 
So the most common use of, of scan data being used today, and this is probably what most of you are familiar with that have some experience around this, is just taking the scans and creating you know, the as-built deliverables. You know, a lot of renovation projects are being done where you walk in, your set of drawings that you have to, to reference off of, start to work with, uh, are either non-existent or very limited. Um, and so the scans allow you to go out and capture that information and create accurate models off of that to start to do uh, design work off of. This is an example from a, a customer that I worked with that was an electrical contractor where they had done a uh, wastewater treatment plant and they were, were required by the owner to go through, scan everything that they had installed and then turn that into a very accurate as-built deliverable at the end of the project. So they went out, took scans of the facility, registered that information, created the models off of that, and on the right-hand side, as you can see, the, the model that they were able to generate off of, off of the scan data itself. Another way the scan data is being used is around uh, prefabrication. Uh, going out, scanning an existing condition, and then using that as part of the prefabrication process. So with you know, scan data, you can go out, scan a room. So in the case here, this is an example of, of a boiler room in which a new boiler uh, was being, a uh, pump assembly was being installed in the, in the boiler room. And the, the contractor in this particular instance went out, didn't have any drawings to start with, and they just went out and scanned the boiler room uh, condition. And what they're interested in doing is rather than modeling everything up off of the, the scan itself, they only modeled the areas where they had uh, a flange connection being put in place. So they took the scan, they registered it, and that's what you see up on the screen, modeled just the connection points for where they were gonna do uh, their connections of the new pump assembly, and then took that into their detailing platform where they created the new pump assembly, had that as a model, and then they could bring it back into the point cloud and overlay the information to ensure that where they had designed the flange connections actually lined up with the, the real world conditions in the field. So that they knew that they had the accurate uh, design, the accurate location before they actually even got out to the job site. And other ways of scan data is being used is around concrete construction. Um, there's a general contractor that I work with back in Denver, where, which is where I'm from, uh, where they go out and make scanning part of their uh, workflow whenever they do any concrete work. So they self-perform their concrete. And what they're doing is, before concrete's poured, they go out on the deck and they scan it with the laser scan to capture the location of all the reinforcement in the slab. So in this particular example, they were uh, documenting the location of the PT cables for a, a post-tension slab uh, deck. And they're going out and that, that little instrument that you see there is a sphere that was used that was being set up over a known uh, survey point on the deck. And they're using that as part of the registration process. So they would go out, scan the deck, and then they register it using those spheres so that they had it geo-referenced to the same coordinate system of, of the building. So as they brought in the files, uh, the scan data, and overlaid it with their model, everything stacked up in the same location. But what they were doing as part of their workflow is they go through and at the beginning of every uh, concrete pour, before the concrete's done, they go out, they scan the deck, uh, bring that into their 3D model and overlay that information. And then they do a post-pour scan as well and overlay that information into their model. And so now they have very accurate representation of the, the conditions of before and after the concrete pour. So that then if there's any design changes that happen you know, during the course of, of the project, they can go into that scan and get a very accurate representation of not only the thickness of the slab at various locations, they can understand where all those PT cables are located so they don't have to stop the project, get someone to come out, x-ray the slab, and determine well, where's a safe area for us to, to move these new locations to. They can actually go off of the scan data, find a new location, and then take the coordinates of that load it into a robotic total station and have that shoot the points for them out in the field so they can keep the, the project going forward. So they've taken this and made this part of their workflow on, a, on, a, on every project where they're doing any self-performed concrete. And the last uh, topic I wanted to just look at briefly was just where scan data is starting to be used now within construction. And it's the idea of doing construction verification using the scan data, taking the scans collecting them on a regular basis, whether that's daily or weekly or monthly, and comparing it back to the 3D coordination model to determine you know, where things have been installed and what things uh, are missing during the construction process. So you have coordination software being used where you've got your 3D coordination model. The scan data is brought in, overlaid on that model. 
And then an analysis is run where the, the model now gets color coded. And what it's doing from a color coding standpoint is anything that's in green is installed correctly, it's within tolerance. Anything that comes up as being yellow is out of tolerance. Uh, anything that comes up as being uh, purple is, is considered occluded, meaning that th there wasn't enough scan, to, uh, scan data to run an, a proper analysis. And anything that comes up red uh, indicates that it's either missing or hasn't been installed yet. And so this information can then now be used to generate reports that can document where things are at certain phases of the project. Uh, and then that information is being used as part of the overall kind of billing process. And it's also being used to say, hey, you know, do we actually have an issue here? Um, is this something that we need to take a look at from a quality control standpoint? So before where they were going out and doing things where just only a few areas could be spot checked from a quality control standpoint, using the scan data and doing this type of analysis now allows project teams to do 100% verification across the entire floor as the, as the project moves forward. So that's just some uh, quick uh, examples of how scan data is being used in the construction industry. Uh, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand it over to uh, the Stangle team uh, to let you see how they're taking scan data, bring it into SketchUp and starting to model off of the, off the data itself. All right, thanks David. Morning everyone, my name is Caton Capilla. Um, I work for Mitchell, I've been working for him for two years now. Um, so in the last uh, presentation, um, in the same room, we took these 3D scanners out and we scanned the hallway. Um, and we just briefly went over to bring that uh, raw scan data into uh, Trimble RealWorks um, and uh, in that process of uh, registration. So once we, uh, so yeah, I'll just quickly go, th go through um, RealWorks. So, um, so when we have, we had two scanners here. We had the, the, the Trimble um, TX6 and TX8. Um, we also had a Faro scanner. Um, and um, so whenever there's a, we, we, we get these um, scan files, whenever we uh, register the files, we often check just to make sure that our CPU is, is, is um, running at high sp uh, full speed and, and, and it hasn't locked up, so. That's just a quick, quick blurb on the uh, import process. So once we actually get to registering, um, we use uh, a method called registration by plane. So we actually don't use targets, um, and that's uh, a feature in the advanced uh, Trimble RealWorks. And um, and so once we have our registered uh, point cloud, we we can further refine it with cloud-based registration. Uh, we then orient the um, the scan and select a, an origin. Um, and segment out what the specific area we're looking at modeling. Um, so there's just a, there, there's more file formats that export um, from RealWorks, but these are just a few that we've worked with. Um, and we found that an E57 uh, file seems to export the quickest. Um, and so once we, once we have that E57 file, which is where, where we left off at the, uh, the last presentation, what do we do with it? So um, here's where Undet comes in. And um, there's a, the first process is getting that E57 file to um, a file that Undet can read. So Undet is, is a plugin um, that, that uh, Rayleigh here in the back of the room has, uh, has developed. And th again, this allows us to, to bring in that point cloud into, um, into SketchUp. So I'll just uh, get rid of this presentation and go right into SketchUp. So I'm just gonna start right, right from the beginning. Okay. So the first step is, um, is uh, as I mentioned, uh, indexing. So there's a few different options here. We, we stick to the building infrastructure objects and plants um, and that just has to do with the the, uh, the density of the scan, um, and Aurelius has just released um, a new version of Mundet and a, a user manual that that really goes through all these different functions really well and uh, describes it um, in, in a bit more detail. So here we're, we're just going to find that E57 file, select it, and open it. Um, I'm not going to show this process, even though we only had about eight scans. This it, it'll take about you know five ten minutes. So um, I'm. After we have that conversion done, uh, we'll open up the, which is generate an IPCP file. 
Um, so we just open that directly. And now you can see that we have the point cloud within SketchUp. Um, so now what we can do here, um, the, the density will, will change on um, how, how much, how many points you're displaying or what, what volume of points you're displaying. So uh, we use what's called this clipping box and we can just say segment out the specific area we're looking at. So we'll just, uh, I'm just gonna demo, demonstrate this, uh, the hallway out here. Um, so once we clip, we can take it and uh, I'll just take the ceiling off. So that, that gives you a better idea of uh, sort of the, the density at this, this volume. So we can, um, in order to increase that even more, we'll just focus on a door here. So that gives you a better idea. So we can, um, we can essentially just trace, trace the, uh, the point cloud um, as you're modeling. Um, so uh, I prefer to, uh, at this point, use parallel projection. I know a lot of SketchUp users don't like parallel projection. Um, but in this instance, I find it helps um, just because you can see that cluster of points along the plane and really, um, and really find that definition. Um, So as you can see, it's just, there, there isn't a, a, a method to um, snap to the point cloud. Um, so it is r really just tracing um, and finding that, that sweet spot with the, uh, with the points. So um, it, there, Undead has uh, a few other functions that'll let you extract um, points, um, just individual points which you can use to snap to. Um, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, you can you can create a construction point to snap to. Um, Does the uh, scan have any uh, uh, textural qualities or maps to it that you can select when you're in there right now? Sorry, could you say that again? Does the scan have any like uh, textural or uh, 3D qualities you could uh, select or even uh, snap to? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand your question. Does the, does the scan have mass that you've imported right now? So Maps? Mass. Mass. Oh, no. So, yeah, it's, sorry, I apologize. Yeah, it's all, all just points. Um, there's no mesh, there's no uh, 3D model within the point cloud that you bring in. And that's, you know, this process is, is creating that model from the, uh, from the cloud. And um, so, yeah, it's essentially just going through and, and tracing that, that model. Um, so if we, if we just increase this a little bit, I'll uh, quickly model the, the hallway, just. Uh, you, can, you can, it's under thick floors, walls, okay. But I think we're all really uh, good SketchUp users. You have to redo that uh, export process. You have to have the 
export out real words the Orient and right. So you can add all, everything, ground, rotation, or you have to rotate your model to it. And the problem with it in workflow for SketchUp is that we use cut and paste a lot. So we'll go back and take new parts of the model back in. And the London model has the facility to move around in the software, but you got to write a lot of stuff down if you want to predictably do it the same way every time. So we try to make point file, we try to model to the point file and not move the point file around. So the end of the will work for us. Chris, do you want to add? Yeah, so tolerances. You know, how much do you need to keep each amount of back of your check? You have to you move the point five to where a pick hole would be a uh, preset. You know, mention that we know with one inch of commits. And in practice, it's a bit of both. Also, nothing is really square. The wall is not perfectly flat. And the ceiling isn't either. There's some weight to it. So we often don't use the uh, we don't make a construction point out of the point by itself because if I pull a construction point on the front side of the wall or the ceiling up here and then move it back, it's going to be a different pipe. So all in all, it turns into you know, very educated and very finely you know, considered tracing, as you're doing right now, much as you would do off a of PDF. So you, as a designer or engineer or architect, you're going to have to figure out where you want that ceiling to be if you're modeling it flat and it really isn't. And if you know it's supposed to be 24 feet high, one side is 24 feet and 3 eighths, and the other is 23 foot and 11 sixteenths, you can set it to 24, so you know where it is. If you're really concerned with that, you might model in the slope. But ultimately, it comes down to seeing where the pixels and the SketchUp push full face will start to just barely phase out. And you can keep zooming in, keep zooming in. Um, right now, what Caden is modeling off of, that point cloud is sampled version from RealWorks, sampled at about one point, or the point spacing is about every two millimeters. RealWorks goes far more uh, tight than that, far more tight. So you could export that if you're really concerned down to a sixteenth of an inch or below, 64th, 128th, you can export that higher density and zoom in and actually see the resolution. And then once you're happy at that particular point, you know, set a hard dimension so you don't see the difference. You know, that would be at the bottom right hand side of the screen. There, in, we, what we set up front is we like to work in SketchUp. So if you have a bent beam or you have some architecture that's very organic and you really want it dead on, real works will import that stuff. It works great. But it makes really heavy objects. You're going to create a surface that's identical to what's out there, but it's going to be 30 megabytes. Okay, 
And as SketchUp users, we are trying to make things that you guys would laugh at this, but our industrial plants, we want to show the client and make them appeasing, I mean, pleasing to look at so we can zoom around them and show them what we're building, our design. And we can't do that with every object being 30 or 40 megabytes. We need it to be 10 or 12. Okay. Sir, please. Is that cooking block a part of the uh, un undeck? Or is it a. So I've never seen anything like that in SketchUp. The 3D clipping box? Yes, that's part of Earned Deck. And is that an actual SketchUp object that could be exported? I can get the What Caton pulled in was that ICP file, and that's an Earned object used only by their application. Okay. You know, it's and the next question would be on like your push pulling and so forth. Um, normally, I think in a point cloud, you without this, you would start trying to snap to those points. Right, um, those points are not snappable. There is a feature to go in and you can take a few out. That was my question. But if all those are snappable, that would be a nightmare. You'd have like a million or so. Yes, yes. So I did a little way to the point well snap. Right. So right now you can go select one of them. So if you do have a beam going across your structure and you want to see the, the end result, you can go and select certain points and Yes. Yeah, so what I'm demonstrating up here. Um, is uh, here is the, the the point method. So you can, so we'll, for example, we'll take this uh, this light fixture. So we can take a point directly from that, move over to this one, take a point from there, and now we can actually snap to those points as they are construction points. So. And this would be up to you, but in practice, we find the tracing method much like you would off the PDF if you're modeling some existing plans from that. You know, if we're not rushing, taking our time, it's more than accurate enough. Growing steel or wood beams, that sort of thing. But again, it depends on what kind of accuracy. As engineers, I'm happy with this example. It's equivalent to when you import an AutoCAD file and you get every layer and every line, you have so much stuff to deal with. It takes you longer to erase all the stuff that you don't need than it does if you just model over PDF. I mean, that's not always true. But. And then just a question with workflow from your scan, how much of a long that takes, obviously it's about the size, but from mm -hmm. that, coming back to your office, what's the workflow to get to, to, to this point? Once you upload everything, okay, let's just say that this whole thing, so we can know what size it's got. So, yeah. Start to finish our workflow. First, we've got some plane tickets. Take a day to fly out, and we'd be here, and we take 30 minutes to scan the, uh, the hallway. Since we're here, we'd probably scan most of the other rooms, too, since we're here. Um, take either a plane out the next day or even that afternoon. I like being home. Um, once we come back to the office, we'd be loading those scans into RealWorks. The uh, importing and registration process will take for, you know, say something if we were to do this hallway, the courtyard, and a couple of the, the levels, it'd take about a day, maybe two days. And a lot of that is uh, not a lot of input from us. We're using the automatic registration, so we can push that button and walk away. Occasionally monitor the computer to make sure it's on, it not crash or anything. Crashes doesn't happen very often. Um, once it's registered, we'll then take that registered point cloud, segment it out, there's going to be like the stands of the trees on the way outside, you know, some reflections from the windows, and cut them out, which takes an hour or two. Export it into the E57 file, and then <coughs> load it into the as Kate, as Kate uh, did earlier. The registration process and then getting it into Undead, the point you see now, take, you know, say if we have 100 stands, about two or three days off this time. But again, that's just the time span. There's not a lot of effort or actual work involved in us. The computers are doing most of the work. So it ties up the machine, but it's not really tying up the time. You just have to account for that in the schedule. Chris, yes? Uh, sometimes working with extremely sensitive historic sites, how do you guys combat uh, mirrors and windows in cleaning up that data? Because obviously, if you're scanning a mirror, it looks like there's a whole other room on the other side. It looks like nothing. It looks like a splash of money. Glass, you look through. Okay, so there are things 
scan straight through, mirrors look like a black. And maybe it's different if you use a color scan and you can get an image there, right? If you see the image, but you don't see anything. It's just a flat place on the wall. Okay, so then if any reflective surfaces don't, don't matter at all, it's the lasers aren't going to Hey, Davis, you have any experience? Every time I've done some big windows, they go right through the plexiglass. I haven't had any problem. You'll get you'll get some re reflectivity depending upon you know what this what the surface will do. Um, you clean that up inside the RealWorks software. That's where you do the registration. Um, so what that will do is you'll see it, it. It basically you'll just see a ghosted image. There'll be white points. They're pretty clear to identify. Uh, and you just do a process called segmentation. So you just isolate a little box. You can do a lasso around the elements you actually want to use, or if you want to just take those out. You just, do it all there in, in that software. You take it out, and then you can export out just the cleaned up version. So it's all done inside the, the scanning software as, as, as before you take it into this step here. This whole process is giving you a ton of data, and the process of getting the data takes a while. But like Chris said, it's mainly a computer time. It's not your time. And then the modeling, we find, goes really quickly. It's easy. And it's accurate. Chrome, they do, you know, or something. They all show up fine. Yeah. But yeah, we I mean, do. We've only used some Trimble products, and we've had no problem with reflectivity. None of that. And I don't know if they, they know more about the product. It yeah, may we, be a problem, but never we have a problem with this. Yeah, we do like uh, like road shop, uh, roadshow workshops for scanning where we go to uh, microbreweries. So whenever I, I go to those, I go a day early and I go and I scan like the, the brewing area and all their fermentation tanks and everything are, you know, that high reflectivity right. and you don't have an issue with it. There's some surfaces where you might have, you know, a lot of reflectivity bouncing off of it, but in terms of capturing the data, it hasn't been a problem. Yep. This is kind of a question about the, uh, not the undead, the uh, the real mm -hmm. Yeah, real works. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, you can do the registration of the FLS files in the real world as well. Can you talk about um, your process for aligning the, your the scans, the point clouds, with um, with other models that you already have going, like a you know an existing model, coordination model, for instance? Right. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Our, our workflow for that, um, since we, we don't geo-reference our models and they're all relative to, it, to itself, um, we, we, we can just move around that scan uh, or the model to the scan, and depending on what, what really works best. Um, obviously, if you're moving the model to the scan, all your paste in places won't, won't, right, won't carry over. So, <clears throat> um, yeah. Um, Uh, I do. Yep. Chris, do you have a suggestion? Mitchell? Wooten? <laughs> Let's see. Yep. I'm up all Wooten. Okay, so you want to update it that way. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm going to pull up here. So is it program code or So here's an example of a, a facility that we did an entire s scan of and, uh, and modeled from it. So I'll just turn off the cloud so you can see a little bit better. Um, so in our modeling, um, for example, for these, these trusses, we don't really need the full detail. We just need a a spatial you know, awareness of it so we don't get into the nitty gritty detail um, just to keep our models very light. So that's one of the examples that we um, do in modeling for while we're modeling undead, with Undead. So and again, this was um, a project that was scanned, um, scanned initially um, and then um, just to capture the as-built conditions. Um, and then this this green building here is what we what we added. Um, so this is this is what the site looked like before um, and after. And so this the scan you're seeing is actually a scan of the after, obviously because the building is here. Um, question. Yeah, so we have a bunch of um, components for all of our steel sections, and we just bring that in and, and just drop it on. Um, and, and again, it's that chasing method where you're just trying to find that perfect plane uh, where, the, where the cloud sits on. Sure, yeah, you can, you can measure it um, with our list of components. We can just replace them and just see which one, you know, will fit best, so. Really long stand, so you can get that level of detail for us. Sure, and then to add up 
cloud size that you can bring in to Well, you can, I guess, you can sample back um, the, the amount of cloud, the points that come in. So really, it all depends on the device that you have. Like construction variability, yeah. No, we, we uh, I haven't myself, Chris. I don't know if you. We, we we haven't done that because what we have to do is export the DWG model, bring that in real work, and it's just clumsy. I mean, Dave, correct me. What we do now, un unhand, bring it as unhand check, right? So it's possible. I guess the point of all this for us is that you have this real. You take all this really rich data. Sorry? We don't have it on the, the stick of knowledge, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, but we, we can, we can uh, pass it around afterwards or, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so you, 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 can, you can see all the little um, white dots here. Um, that, those were the places where we scanned. So that, that would give you an idea. There was three around here. And again, the, the, the 3D scanner is a line of sight device. So whatever you, know, it, it, it can see, whatever you can see, it can also see. So um, if there's an obstruction here, you're not going to capture anything behind it. Right? So that, that's, uh, that's kind of the method to, to using the scanner and, and then bringing it in. Yeah, so you want to have some sort of overlap. Um, common planes, so um, the automatic registration can, will be much faster, essentially, and bring it in all together rather than you know, separate groups. Yep. Right, so yeah, for this one, each of these were two minutes. Question. Yeah. Not, not in SketchUp, but you can do that inside RealWorks. So you can take that and apply those images onto the surface. So RealWorks has some modeling capabilities where it's going to create 3D solids, 3D objects that you can then export. There's a direct export out of RealWorks into SketchUp. So you can apply the images in the RealWorks product and then push it over. Um, say if you're doing like you want to do edges or anything like that, you can identify those edges inside of RealWorks. And I'll push the edges over as construction lines into SketchUp. So if you want to be able, like you were talking about, being able to snap and things like that, you can bring those construction lines in and then be able to have an edge to snap to if you want to create walls and things like that. The problem here is we're not really architects. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> when do you guys see this moving into like strapping these on drones or something like that? Because obviously as you scan up, you're not getting any of the tops of anything, right? Do you see this moving to where you can put this on a drone? That would be great. We would love that. Oh, sure. Can we have that bit? Not as that accurate. So you can do things like that, but you're not going to get accurate. And we really want the millimeter accuracy. So you're just not going to get it. So I mean, yes. So people say they can do it, but it's like, uh, 
Um, everybody in this room works with 3D, but how many of us know other professionals that don't use 3D? And I would say 3D is not common. Yeah, it's getting common, but it's still, I still see too much 2D work flowing to us. Question? Yeah. Will, the, will your software play nicely with data that I get from my LiDAR drone? You want to be clear. Oh, sorry. This is was that a question to David? Yeah, no, no. yeah, the realware software is where you bring in like yeah. multiple formats. Yeah, well, it'll really play it. nice with non trimble Yes, data. Yeah, so what it does is it's set up to bring in so you all you have the trimble formats and you have like the industry standard formats. So you bring in the industry standard formats, so E57 files, LAS files, uh, those types of standards you can bring into the real world program and begin to work with it just like it. There's a native Trimble file as well. So it's set up to bring that in. Uh, we have a couple different partnerships with other types of vendors out there as well to where we can bring their files in. So the whole point is to use that to, to work with the data. And then once you've got the data, then you can push it out like into SketchUp. So there's a, inside of RealWorks, there's a button for SketchUp that then as you start to work with things and model it, you can export it out in SketchUp. So you, you click on that, it opens an instance, and it'll push it straight into the so a lot of that kind of heavy lifting, you do that in the scanning software. Yes, question? Can you import fix 4D or drone from that? I'm uh, not sure. I have to take a look at that. I just, yeah, it's in the And any point on fix for many technology drones, library, we use the terrestrial scanners, mobile guidance scanners, whatever. Any XT file XYZ, what's the next big caveat on this is data from anywhere, you just need to know what it is, right? In the accuracy of it. Does anybody have any more questions? Mitchell, you want to? Um, what would that cost to have this, have this corridor model? If we did this? Yes. Well, if they could model? Well, if they could do this in two hours, I'd fire <laughs> In detail. Detail. Yeah. It depends, I mean, this is, right? This is really simple stuff. I mean, it's not. I mean, like, so if somebody was paying me to do this one in a lot of detail, I mean, we would try to use, we would want to do it in color, because I assume you would want the color, we would map off, take pictures out of real works and map them onto it. You know, it's just being possible, right? But generally, we don't do pretty things, so I have to send it to somebody else. Like Dave was told, he likes to do pretty things. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like for a, a fee from like a services company, they would charge you on the number of scans they have to do for the space. So it's, it'd be per scan. Uh, some some companies will say they'll just give you a flat rate and it's as many scans as you want for the day, so you just pay for the day. Um, others will do an estimate based off of you know, if it's a large facility, how many scans do they have to capture. And so that, that's going to vary between companies. It's just whatever they, they want to charge for the service. But it's typically off of how many scans do they have to capture. Any more questions? Yep. What is the advantage of using RealWorks over TVC? So RealWorks is the, the scanning software. It was designed by the Geospatial Division in Trimble. Uh, so that was the primary software. TVC has been importing a lot of the features uh, from RealWorks. So a lot of what TVC is starting to do is kind of the next generation. It's starting to take in a lot of the, the algorithms and things from RealWorks but it has all of its source and all of its history from the RealWorks product. Um, so TVC is designed for more geospatial type of workflows to give you additional capabilities beyond just scanning. So it's kind of a one-stop shop to do multiple things. RealWorks is fully, uh, solely focused on scanning. Who wants to scan? <laughs>
Yeah, that's all, that's all I have. Feel free to ask questions if you have any. <laughs>